And you're here to talk about protein. It's a topic that is of interest to a lot of people, especially in the vegan and vegetarian movement. It's been an interest for, of mine for many years as well because so many people have asked me for so many years, where do you get your protein? And we're sick and tired of hearing that, aren't we? <laughs> so finally, finally let us discuss this in a way that would help you have an appropriate response. And you will know exactly what to say at the end of this lecture. When people say, where do you get your protein, you'll know exactly what to say. So please be patient and stick around until the very end. No matter how boring, no matter how difficult it is to listen to this Israeli accent, stick with me and you'll know what to say. First of all, everybody has been in the vegetarian vegan movement and also in the health food movement talking regularly about fats and also talking a lot about carbs. So we always hear about the low carb diet, the high carb diet, the low fat diet. We don't have much of a high fat diet, do we? <laughs> but people are always hearing these countering effects of fats and carbs. But nobody talks about protein. I've never heard about the low protein diet or the high protein diet. It's just not mentioned. It is simply a dark horse that is in the race. It is one of the macronutrients, the three macronutrients being carbs, fats, and proteins. And we are aware of its importance, but nobody talks about a diet that focuses on protein. Highly suspicious, isn't it? Everybody talks about fats and, and carbs. But where is the protein? So let us look around the world and see where is the protein. Look at all the indigenous people in remote areas that are not north of the 40th parallel or south of the 40th parallel in the south side. Meaning the diets that are more appropriate for the human species before technology allowed humans to go far north or far south. We are, in nature, tropical creatures. We all came from one part in Africa, not too long ago. So let us look at indigenous people in warm climates, since they are much closer to us. And let us also look at people who live long life in various blue zones around the world. And all the science has shown us conclusively and repeatedly, so I don't have to repeat too much, I'm not going to talk about what you already know, which was, if you eat less, you'll be healthier. And if you eat mostly plant-based, you will live longer. That's what all the science told us for many years. Books and articles have been published. So let us not talk about what's obvious. Let's talk about the less obvious. What's the main reason for longer life and for a healthier life when you avoid excessive amount of food and eat more plants? What's the side effect of that? The side effect is that you're simply eating less protein. And that is the secret they don't tell you. You eat less animal products, meaning more plants, you will have less protein and you eat less food in general, which is typical for affluenza-stricken Western civilizations, and by definition, you will have also less protein, because the protein usually comes with a lot of calories. So in other words, all of those scientists who wrote all those amazing books and researched all the long-living peoples of the world could have simply said to us, eat less protein, but they didn't. For some reason, protein became a holy cow. <laughs> Nobody wants to shoot down. Nobody wants to eat. Nobody wants to talk about it. It's politically incorrect. So it's easy to say, eat more carbs and less fat, or eat more fat and less carb. That's easy to say. But if we look at the people around the world that live longer, we don't see a big distinction between the level of fat and the level of carb. 
Look at the Italians with all their pasta, living good life in the 19th century, in the 17th century, in the 18th century. Look at all the Chinese with their white rice, all the Indians and Nepali with their rice and lentils. Look at all the Mid Mediterranean and Middle Eastern with all their pita bread. I'm not saying that they are as healthy as they can be. They're not eating the optimal diets. But they live fairly long life and they're fairly healthy. Until the 20th century came about. Once they started increasing their protein intake, we started seeing chronic disease. So it has nothing to do with how much fat and how much carb they had. And that's because our body can easily convert fats into carbohydrates and carbohydrates into fats. It's so simple for metabolism to create energy from both macronutrients. But protein stands aside as a unique macronutrient that is different from all the others. It's different in that it contains an element, an atom, called nitrogen. And that's the main difference between protein and the other micronutrients. Protein contains nitrogen. Now the body has to do something with that nitrogen in order to convert protein into energy. And that nitrogen becomes the dirty residue of energy metabolism. Just like having a car without catalytic, catalytic converter, converters which are increasing the dirt and the pollution in the air. We want to burn clean because our cells depend on cleanliness. Our tissues do not want to be suffused with toxic metabolizing byproducts of energy production. So we suffer if we have too much nitrogen in our system. And that is why even the medical textbook of physiology that's most famously used in all medical schools, which is called the Guyton Textbook of Medical Physiology. Even there, when they talk about the amount of protein that your body really needs, they talk about the obligatory use of protein, the amount that we actually lose every day in the stool. We're not supposed to lose much, if at all, in the urine. So we look in the stool to see how much protein are you losing every day. Your poop is the marker. <laughs> and if you measure, you see that the average individual, the average man who weighs about 150 pounds, is going to lose anywhere between 25 grams and 35 grams of protein per day. That's the amount that you need to eat just to stay even. You don't need more than that, according to the textbook of physiology. But that textbook does not take into account indigenous people in some places who eat even less protein than that and they're still doing okay. So what's the story with them? Why are some indigenous people in Africa able to sustain themselves of 15 or 20 grams of protein per day? The answer is recycling. If you eat less, you recycle more. You lose less. Because your body knows how to continuously conserve the amount of amino acids available to it for its various function. So the more protein you eat, the more you lose. The body does not need to conserve as much. So even the 25 to 35 grams that is written in the medical book, even that is generous overall in quantity. But we want to be generous, don't we? We want to be as conservative as we can be for the purpose of science, if nothing else. So when we look at all the activities of the body and when and where we need protein, Let's say that we want to be slightly more large with ourselves and give ourselves five extra grams of protein. That will bring us to, let's say, 40 grams at the most. Remembering that this does not take into account how much we recycle.
Now, if you are a typical American, which most of you are atypical Americans, you are here, but you have been influenced by a lot of typical Americans in your life. And they have always told you that protein is primary in our body. It's proteus. Proteus means primary, extremely important. And that's based on old scientists who are no longer alive to undo the damage. They said, after investigating the body, the tissues, the cells, that a really important part of every cell in your body were proteins. And as a result, we assume that protein must be coming into our body in large amounts. But this is a little faulty, because on the contrary, if you can recycle extremely well, that's because the body needs to conserve what it has, and therefore you're not going to be ever necessarily in lack of such a nutrient. As long as you keep conserving it and building with it and it stays in your body. For example, whenever you poop, as we said earlier, half of your poop by volume is the cells sloughing from your own gastrointestinal tract. And those cells contain a lot of protein which gets recycled. The body absorbs it. That's why we don't really miss much. Also, amino acids are very different from other nutrients, like minerals, for example. Minerals, when they get into your body, they have a hard time being absorbed because they compete with each other for absorption. And the body does nothing to absorb them. Your body just sits there passively and hopes that through diffusion, some minerals will make it into your circulation. Unfortunately, today's foods are not as rich with minerals as they once were. So we are getting more and more deficient in minerals as a society. 80 to 90% of people are deficient in zinc, in magnesium, molybdenum, selenium, etc. All of those minerals, when they come in our body, they don't have an easy way because they compete for the receptors in our gastrointestinal lining. And we end up, if we take a lot of minerals in one supplement, and they are the typical minerals that occur in nature, in ionic forms, they will not be absorbed very well. Most of them will remain in your digestive system and cause diarrhea because of a process called osmosis. So the more minerals you have, for example, if you take mineral ascorbate, so vitamin C powder, Vitamin C powder contains a lot of minerals to buffer the acidic nature of it. Those minerals end up in your digestive system, and if you take a lot of that, you will have diarrhea. And if you have constipation, it's a perfect treatment for constipation because it brings more water into your poop, so it doesn't remain so dry and compacted. That's the nature of minerals. They stay in the gut. They don't get easily absorbed. On the other hand, amino acids get proactively absorbed. What does that mean? It means that your body is expending energy to actually take those amino acids and pull them into your circulation, into the cells lining the gut, and then into the circulation. So you are spending energy to proactively absorb the amino acid. And when you spend energy to do something proactively, what do you call it? You're not absorbing, you are adsorbing with a D. Amino acids get adsorbed because our body perceives them as extremely important. Why does our body perceive them as extremely important? Because in nature, we would be eating them in very small amounts. Scarcity is the rule of proteins in nature. In nature, we would have been eating a lot more plants and plant foods. And therefore, we would have amino acids in them. But those amino acids, even if you have the entire constellation of them, 
All the essential amino acids are present in every green leafy vegetable, without exception. In one cup of kale, you get five grams of protein that appears in the form of amino acids. That's a lot. One cup. Those amino acids are complete. This protein is as complete as any protein you can imagine. Even though green leafy vegetables are not considered a good source of protein, by whom? By the cattle industry. By the dairy industry. They tell you that greens are insufficient. Ask the gorilla and the elephant if they are insufficient. Obviously, they are complete proteins, but they occur as amino acids, not as complete large globular proteins. Where do we have complete large globular proteins which can ma maintain 100,000 amino acids in one chain that convolutes upon itself, that has numerous knots, such that we develop one globular entity that is so interconnected, you cannot get anything in there, not even an enzyme can get in there. Those are the globular proteins we find in flesh, in dairy, and in nuts and seeds. Those proteins have a purpose, both in the animals, just like as they do in our own body, as well as in the nuts and seeds. That purpose is easily manifested when we manufacture our own enzymes, which are globular proteins, from what? From amino acids. So every globular protein that gets into your body has to be broken down into its constituent amino acids, or it would not be absorbed. So you are spending a lot of energy just breaking down proteins to the situation where they exist already in the, in the green leafy vegetables and in the fruit and in other plant matter besides the seeds. Those amino acids are much easier for us to digest and to absorb because we don't have to break them down. But as soon as we have them in amino acids in the gut, in that form, that's when we spend the energy to absorb them, to adsorb them. And that's a very important distinction. Nature tells us how much we would have been exposed to in the past. Nature tells us that if we are going to spend that much energy on something, it's because in nature we would have had such a little amount of it that we would have had to make every amino acid count. And what does it tell us about minerals, by the way? What about minerals? Were they abundant in nature? What do you think? Yes or nay? Yes, yes they were abundant in nature. That's why we don't care about them, physiologically. That's why we don't spend energy absorbing them. Because every food in nature, every green leafy, vegetable, every plant that we ate has been rich with minerals because those minerals were rich in the soil. And the plants that grow wild have deep roots, unlike the agricultural produce today. We would have had a lot of minerals. We would never have to worry about them. Plus, in nature, we would not be eating so many foods that make us deplete our mineral storage. When do you lose minerals? When you eat extremely high protein foods. You lose minerals because high protein foods burn in a way that leads to acid formation. Acetic acid, lactic acid, beta hydroxybutyric acid, phosphoric acid, sulfuric acid. Those are all the acids that occur as a result of burning protein. Digesting, metabolizing protein. All those acids build up in our tissues and we have to leach minerals out of our main storage. The bones, the teeth. So we lose minerals as a result of high protein foods, but also 
Our diet today includes many other things, like stimulants, coffee, chocolate, and other stimulants that cause our kidneys to open wide and allow too many minerals to be secreted in the urine. So our diet today makes us much more needy for minerals than we would have in nature. And because nature had so many minerals entering our body, we had no problem getting enough despite the competition between them, and we had no reason to expend energy to get them. Even the water that we drank once in a while in nature was highly mineralized and highly salty. So in nature, minerals were not important. That's why we don't absorb them well. Amino acids were extremely scarce. That's why we absorbed every one of them. Now think about it today, when we eat so much more protein than the past has allowed us to eat. We still have the same mechanism of absorbing amino acid, the same as Native Americans have this genetic mechanism to store energy because they went through many years of drought in the desert and they could not eat some time. So whenever they had more to eat, they ate a lot of it and stored it. And today, because they eat a lot of calories, they store those calories and develop diabetes and obesity and cardiovascular disease in very large amounts because of those storage genes. Well, we all have these genes that tell us to conserve protein because it was so hard to get it in nature. But today we eat a lot of protein. The mechanism still exists. Therefore, even today, despite this surplus of protein, we're going to absorb it extremely effectively and conserve it and recycle it so we don't lose our protein. We keep it and we get poisoned by it. That's the secret they don't tell you when they keep churning and churning and chewing on water when talking about fats and carbs, but not about the poison of protein when taken in excess quantities. So what does a typical American eat in terms of protein? The average American, and of course there is no such thing as an average because it depends which part of the country you live. If you are in the south, in the deep south, you're probably eating a lot more protein than if you are in the north. But this has been changing recently because now a lot of northerners have become health-oriented. And nowadays the health-oriented people are increasing their protein abuse. Not use, but abuse. Because they are still brainwashed by the cattle and dairy industry to believe that protein is so good that the more the merrier. And they are gravitating towards anything on the shelf that has the word high protein on it. And that is why even the naturalists among you, the vegans, the natural food individuals, the health nuts among you are eating today a lot more protein just because of your awareness, just because of your desire to be healthy. Isn't that sad? That those who deserve to be the healthiest because they put their efforts and they put a lot of money into their healthy foods, that these are the people that are now degrading their health by increasing their protein level to the same level as meat and dairy eaters have. So you remember the Loma Linda study from back in the previous century where the Seventh-day Adventists were studied with their two groups, one was vegetarian, one was not. And they had this amazing scientific study that those who were vegetarian lived on average 10 years longer. They had already back then, 30 years ago, more, they already had an average lifespan of 87. 
whereas the other group only 77. This is huge. 10 years as an average, unbelievable. And we have seen other studies back in the 20th century showing conclusively that people who have less protein in their diet actually have better health outcome. But now, we're not going to see these differences anymore. Because all the health food fanatics are moving back towards protein. Why? Because of major corporate entities that know how to capitalize on information that has been inculcated into our brains for so many years that we always had to be apologetic and excuse ourselves from being vegetarian and tell people with sorry, I'm getting my protein from, from more nuts. I'm getting more protein by eating more dairy alternatives, by increasing my soy. And because of this apologetic behavior, we always try to get more protein from other sources. And we have even been told incorrectly in one of the first books of the movement, the book about a diet for a healthy planet, by Francis Morlape, the first edition. She made the big error of falling in that trap and saying that we need to complement our foods in order to get complete protein. Saying you need to have some grains and legumes in the same meal in order to have a complete protein. Which scientifically was proven to be incorrect because we have the amino acid pool in the body, not just in the liver, but in general, and because nobody eats just corn to be deficient in tryptophan. Nobody eats just one type of grain or just one type of bean, and that's it. There is no culture like that in nature, so why even make an issue of it unless we're simply trying to make vegetarians feel inappropriate, self-conscious, psychologically less happy with themselves, looking for excuses, telling doctors that this is the one thing they should blame if they have a patient who is vegetarian, to blame that when they have any kind of disease. When in reality, we all know how 98, 99% of Americans eat flesh and are the most chronically diseased people on earth. So obviously that's not a scientific way to evaluate a patient. It is more like the grandmother's knee-jerk reflex. What my mother taught me is what I'm going to tell my patient, not what I studied in school, which doesn't teach about nutrition anyway. But that is the kind of psychology that has been gradually evolving within us, leading us to ultimately blame everything on our vegetarian choices and thinking we have no, no protein to meet our needs. So, as soon as those big industries in the 21st century, in the last five years only, have succeeded in convincing us that this is what we need. They're high protein foods, but they are plant-based, so vegetarians come and buy. So you have all those bags that are high protein plant-based foods, high protein bars, high protein snacks and we all are buying it because we are no better than the cigarette smokers who bought cigarettes 60 years ago because they thought it was good for them because there were some medical studies sponsored by the tobacco industry of course that proved that smoking cigarettes would be good for your health and everybody went into the cigarette smoking habit, which, as you know, in the 30s and 40s and 50s, the normal thing to do was smoke. The common thing to do. So now the normal and common thing to do is to eat stimulants like coffee and chocolate and to eat high protein. That's common today and it is perfect for the medical industrial complex and the drug companies because it keeps us sick. It keeps us chronically diseased, and it keeps the system going, inflationary growth. 
Everybody is in recession, but the medical complex is always inflationary. Because more and more people are sick, and the treatment is more and more expensive. And the main cause, according to everybody who comes to the United States from indigenous places, as soon as they come here and increase their protein content, they immediately develop the same chronic disease that they never had before, whether it's cancer, diabetes, cardiovascular disease, autoimmune disease, neurodegenerative disease, and the list goes on. It's the protein. You lost something. So the average American health food fanatic, if you want to use that term, in the 21st century has bought this concept that was started many years ago by the cattle industry and the dairy industry. So now even we, vegetarians and vegans, are believing that concept that we need more protein because we buy all those high protein foods. Many of them are called superfoods. And they're really expensive because they're just food. And food should not be that expensive. And food should be grown locally. It should not come from far, far away in plastic and aluminum foil. <laughs> it should be bulk produce. It should be sustainable. That's what real food is. It should not cost $30 or $50 for a package that has a long shelf life because even the stupidest bacteria are not interested in eating it. <laughs> Yet what do we do? We fall in that trap. Now, I feel sorry for a lot of those industries, and especially the salespeople who represent them, because they really mean well. They think they've discovered some kind of an elixir of youth. They want to sell it because they think we're going to sell a good thing. But they don't know that they're harming themselves and other people. I feel sorry for them. And maybe that's why you still have enough compassion in you to buy their product. But let me assure you, if you stop buying them altogether today, they will find something else to sell. They will be okay. Don't worry about their welfare. They'll sell something a little healthier. And they will be healthier for it too. Throughout the generations, we always had a continuous flow from one type of product to another to another. Look at the big change in the last 20 years with computers and iPads and iPhones and whatnot. Things will change. Everybody will ultimately find a job if they are willing to work. Don't worry about those industries. Are you worried about the tobacco employees? Not anymore. There aren't that many of them left. But you don't worry about their job. You know that they will find something else to sell, right? The same is true here. These well-intending people that we all like and cherish who want to sell you products that are vegan, they really mean well. But if you buy, they get the message that there is demand and they will keep selling and you will keep getting sick. That's basically the formula. So how much protein does the average vegetarian in the 21st century eat when he or she continuously buys proteinaceous foods, high protein foods. Maybe on average 90 to 100 grams of proteins. Remember how much we actually need. And we'll talk about athletes in a minute and bodybuilders and so on because I know some of you would want to ask. But before that, if we actually eat between 90 and 110 grams of protein, let us investigate what would the most strict vegan will eat in protein, in grams. And when I say protein, I mean loosely the, the total or the totality of amino acids and protein in, in every given day. What would the typical fanatic vegan, strict vegan who does not buy any superfoods, does not buy any high protein bars and powders and, and artificially processed and packaged boxes and products like that, 
What does this person, the fanatic, strict vegan, only eating fresh produce, some nuts and seeds, some grains and legumes, lots of fruit, lots of greens, how much protein will that person eat today? At least 60 to 70 grams per day. So please, don't tell me that person has a hard time getting enough. Remember the 35 was the top limit of obligatory protein to compensate for what's lost in our stool. And we added an extra five to be nice. So we went to 40 grams. Would a person having 70 or 60 ever be in a problem situation? No. Now let us explain why is it that some of us do get so much more protein than we actually need. And maybe there is no way around it. So if there is no way around it, we have to accept it and perhaps live to 118 instead of 120. Yeah. But still have a fairly good life. It's not perfect, but it would be fairly good. As long as we don't keep cheating on a regular basis, right? So once in a while, we eat too much. But on average, we will eat a little more on a daily basis than what nature told us we would have eaten. Well, the reason is that there are certain nutrients containing more amino acids that are necessary for detoxification. Our bodies today are polluted and so is the environment, I don't have to tell you. So we need more amino acids that are crucial for the detoxification process in the liver. I have a 90-day detoxification program that explains the entire science of detoxification, what your body really does to eliminate and process toxins. There are at least 15 steps involved throughout your whole body, and if even one step is not taken care of, the whole process does not move forward, just like a domino effect that is stopped because one domino is still standing. We need some more amino acids than we would have in, in a natural, pristine environment. We also need more fats for the same reason. Our immune system requires some more of these very amino acids for its own function. That is why today we almost have to, if we live in a polluted city, or in most western areas, even if you live in the great outdoors, next to some farm that goes spraying, pesticide and so on, all those residues that get into your body from the air that you inhale and the water you drink and the food you eat, you will have a little greater need for some more amino acid, which is why we feel so good when we eat whole grains and whole legumes, when we eat lentils and other beans, when we eat quinoa and buckwheat and amaranth, etc. We feel good because partially we feel we need more of those dense nutrients that contain for us some of those external uh, additional amino acids. And that's why we eat more of those seeds, those tiny seeds that in nature, there's no way we would have been exposed to su such a good quantity of them. Where in nature would you have enough seeds to make one loaf of bread? Enough seeds to have one bowl full with, with beans? It wouldn't happen. Today we eat more of those and we get more calories and we suffer a little bit as a result, but we also get more of those nutrients and our protein level increases as a result to maybe 50, 60, 70 grams, depending on how much we eat. Our body seems to still handle somehow the toxicity associated with that increased amount. And of course for some people it's significantly too much. But for most of us, we can handle a little more of this toxicity. And this toxicity is basically coming from the nitrogen. When we create energy out of the surplus of protein, we have to decapitate the amino acids, take out their nitrogen, and it creates new compounds like ammonia. Ammonia is highly toxic in our body. We have to create new compounds like nitrosamines and heterocyclic amines. 
we have to create new free radicals, like nitrogen free radicals which our body does not know how to handle. We are very well equipped to handling the oxygen free radicals. That's why we manufacture all those natural antioxidants inside our cells that are designed to take out, to neutralize oxygen free radicals from metabolizing of fats and carbohydrates. But now we have all this surplus of protein and we have nitrogen free radicals which we are ill equipped to handle and they stick with us. And every time you eat fatty foods, those nitrogen free radicals will turn them into rancid fats. Rancid fats are one of the main cause of aging. So we are paying the price of having that excess, excess amount of protein. But bringing it up to 100 grams per day is inexcusable. By buying those high protein foods. That's a bad thing. Now I don't have much time because somebody showed me that I have to finish pretty soon, right? So if you want to hear a lot more about proteins and the science of it, just like I mentioned today, but a little more in depth and covering other topics related to protein on the table B38, B38 or 38B, whatever it is, there are CDs and there's a double CD on protein, the truth about protein, which allows you to get all this information and listen to it again and again until you get really thoroughly in your mind and you'll be able to recite it quickly and easily to all of your friends. <laughs> if you want some free information, and most people want free information, there's a website called thetruthaboutyourfood.com The Truth About Your, not mine, yourfood.com and that one has six seminars, almost two hours each covering all the fundamentals that everybody should know about food. The truth about food, protein, processing, supplements, etc. So you can get some of the basic no-nonsense science that you haven't heard until now in sufficient quantity or in one place. And it is all founded on reality of nature and biochemistry. So that's really important if you want to know that. Um, now, back to people who are athletes. Those who are athletic and are building muscles all the time, trying to build muscles, some of them eat in excess of 200 grams of protein per day. You can only imagine how toxic they are. They are totally poisoning their own bodies. Just to look good. Now, maybe they look good for a while but they will pay the price later because those proteins are damaging their kidneys just by having to secrete all those acidity re uh, residues through the, the poor kidneys, those nephrons that have to handle and tolerate so much acid. So when you eat whey protein, which is a byproduct of the dairy industry which used to be thrown away, now they make a lot of money selling it as a supplement for bodybuilders and everybody who wants to look like them and buys them too. Those will poke holes in your kidneys because they're so acid forming in your tissues. And all those other highly proteinaceous food that people eat on a regular basis, some health gurus eat 15 eggs for breakfast. I don't have to tell you that they are poisoning themselves with too much protein, but they are health gurus to some people. It's all in the protein. Some people will not eat so, so many, not to go above 200 grams. They will say, I still want to maintain muscle mass and avoid losing weight. Remember, it's not about the protein, whether you lose weight or not. It's about the calories and your metabolism. So if you have enough fat and enough carbs, you're not going to have a problem losing weight. On the contrary, you might gain some. It's not about the protein that you would need in order to gain weight or to keep it. And if you want to increase protein content of your muscles, 
by adding a few grams of muscles every day, even the strongest bodybuilders, the ones who are most successful, never exceed 10 grams gain of protein in terms of muscle mass per day. 10 grams is a lot, I'm being really generous, because 10 grams normally would mean at least a big percentage of that would be water, because each cell, including muscle cell, is mostly water. But if we gain 10 grams of muscle mass per day and want to be generous and say that the entire 10 grams are protein, then think about it. You might go from 40, from 40 grams obligatory use plus 5 grams being nice and generous, then another 10 grams. So you get to 50. 50 grams. Even the strictest vegan has more than that, as we said earlier. Nobody is going to be deficient. Unless you are starving calorically and eat nothing but white sugar and white flour. <laughs> nothing but that. And it's very rare that anybody in our society would fit these parameters because if you have enough calories, you have enough to convert to energy and your entire intake of protein will be continuously reused for building. You won't lose any. Only people who are starving calorically could end up in great need of using their paucity of protein for energy production. But most of us have already too many calories to begin with. So all the excess protein is going to be converted to energy and lead to poisoning, to cancer, to toxic agents that I mentioned in that Truth About Protein double CD. Those toxins that make you at higher risk of chronic disease and cancer. And the last aspect here, before I give you the answer to all of those people who bug you about how, where you get your protein, the last thing I want to mention is the nature of globular protein, the kind of protein that is only found in flesh, dairy, nuts, seeds, grains, legumes, which makes us have to avoid excess of those especially the nuts and seeds, which are difficult to digest because of the high level of polyunsaturated fats. So I usually tell people not to have more than three or four tablespoons of nuts and seeds per day. And that is in my six free teleseminars at thetruthaboutyourfood.com, what you should be eating. So you can never say I'm hungry after you listen to that one. Those three to four tablespoons prevent us from having significant digestive dysfunction. The more digestive dysfunction we get, the more leaky and inflamed our gut can become, and the proteinaceous food that are globular protein containing will lead to potential allergies and sensitivities. Some of them will not be broken down completely to amino acids, in which case we would actually absorb through the leaky gut complex polypeptides or oligopeptides or dipeptides or tripeptides, which means only two amino acids together or three amino acids together or a small amount. Those should never be absorbed in nature. But now they are getting into our circulation, initiating an immune response. That's why almost all the allergenic foods that you know of, that all the manufacturers say free of soy, dairy, eggs, corn, gluten, etc. You all know about these. These are all coming from globular protein. So that's another reason to avoid excessive amount of protein is especially to avoid foods that are rich in protein, especially if they're called superfoods, because that's when you're going to eat them every day as a supplement. And that's when you get the same globular protein into your body, day after day after day, without giving the immune system a rest. That's when you develop significant allergies, inflammation, autoimmune disease. That's why I'm telling people, avoid the hemp seeds. A lot of protein that you have every day because you're told it's a superfood. You're going to become allergic and sensitive to it. The same is true for chia, and the same is true for, um, for flax, ground flax that you have every day on your food. All those proteinaceous foods that you would have eaten in nature only once in a while, twice a year, three times a year, one short season, 
Now you're exposed to them all year long, and they're called superfoods, so you might put them into your body every day. And that's why they're actually damaging you in the long run. They're not real foods, they were never even known as foods in nature. If you come to our fold and study with our university, you will learn a lot more about the concepts of allergenicity, sensitivity, and how our body functions, so that you can make the appropriate decisions for health and longevity. What is the answer to people who say, where do you get your protein? The answer is, how do you avoid excess? <laughs> That's what you should always tell them. How do you avoid excess? Write it down. How do you avoid being poisoned by too much? That's another way of saying it. You can be creative. <laughs> say it in however you want, whatever fashion. And that would be the best and most correct answer. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.